random places so the API server knows about it and can serve it. And with that, it works. I will send you a patch. Sweet. I noticed you didn't update uh, V1 beta API. And I had to update it because it's registered in the same place as V1 API. Do we have to do both? Does that... Uh... I don't know. Uh, probably this is the new not. Picture that's being added, right? Probably not. But the registration of the API is done one, on one place, and I was too lazy to look how to split it mm. into two. Okay. I'll take a look at that. And, uh, this registration yeah. is mostly a random process. I just search for storage classes, <laughs> for string storage classes, and change everything to volume attachment, and that's it. <laughs> and from some reason, I can't pull from your GitHub repo. I don't know why. Mm. Something's wrong on GitHub. Mm. Okay, so it looks like Vlad's here too. Um, we can officially kick it off. Um, so like Jan was mentioning, I sent out the API uh, last night. And Jan's been uh, kicking the tires on it. Uh, and is there anything else you wanted to add, Jan? No, it looks working. Jordan has a couple of interesting comments, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> we'll I have a goes. meeting with uh, Jordan uh, scheduled in about an hour and a half. Uh, so yeah, I won't be there. Can you record it for me? Uh, yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll record it. Thanks. Are you talking about the volume attachment uh, object you just added? Uh, yes. Yes. So uh, this is expected to be the most uh, controversial part of the uh, project. Uh, API changes always are. Uh, so expect that we're going to be uh, we're going to have folks that are going to say why this, why that, and you just have to address all of that. Uh, so other than the API changes uh, on my agenda, I added a, so I sent out an email yesterday. I created a Kubernetes CSI repo because volume CSI seemed incomplete to me. <laughs> Sorry, Brad. Uh, now that we have two repos, uh, I'm thinking we could use one as a place to host the components that we will officially ship. Uh, external attacher, external provisioner, and looks like uh, CSI test has already been added there. Uh, and then we could use uh, the existing um, organization, of CSI volume, as a playground to just mess around in. Any thoughts so, on that? Or? So the attacher should be in the new CSI repo, not in external storage. Uh, yes, that's what I'm uh, thinking. OK. Uh, but I can, like, that's whatever you think is better. Well, the external attacher is OK anywhere. External provisioner could be easier in the existing, the existing. Uh Yeah, uh, whatever you guys think is the best, I'm going to leave it up to you to decide. We have all these options open to us. Uh, right now, let's, for alpha, just get the code somewhere. And then uh, post alpha, we can figure out what the best permanent home is. OK. All right, so just Kind of repeat what, what was just said. The 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 external attack. Are we talking about an external attacher, or uh, because from from the design doc uh, attachment is going to happen internally, right? Attachment is going to happen internally, and the internal attach is going to create a uh, attachment yeah. object. Right. Uh, and then you have an external attacher which watches these attachment objects. Oh, right, right. Acts to them. So there's two components to it. There's the okay. internal one and there's the external one. Okay, just want to make sure because. Mm -hmm. All right. So that then uh, I'll remove the CSI test from CSI volumes and I'll just keep this one. Okay. Just, uh, I sent a request to allow uh, Travis uh, uh, access. So yep. as soon as that's there, then it'll be all set. Is anybody using it? I, I saw like a whole bunch of pulls from yesterday's repo. So, oh, I haven't had a chance to look at it since I opened it. Okay. Uh, 
Um, it looks like uh, Vlad's got a cool looking logo. Yeah, I did take a look at it. Um, I didn't use it. Um, I mean, the, my my comment is that it's it's going to be okay for uh, for doing um, unit tests. Yeah. Definitely will be coming handy. Um, but for integration and end to end, we're going to need something a little bit more. The, my only concern with uh, when you have to script, when you have to, when you're doing be behavior based testing, you know, you hope that what you're scripting is in accordance to mm. what the what the actual API spec says. So it, it definitely it would be something convenient to to get the you know low hanging fruit unit testings. But for something that that is pegged to the that is pegged to the uh, actual spec, um, you know, we just got to make sure that people are aware that just because you pass the unit test, you may not pass the the uh, and and the and against an actual implementation. That's so yeah. So there's there's two things I completely agree with you. That there's a difference between testing your code, making sure it works and it does what is expected. That's that's the unit test. And there's a difference between verification of the spec, and that's something oh, else. That's something else that I'm punting on because that's right, something the right. CNCF should determine. Right. And and even that will take a long time because one of the issues with that is that you got three different, three or four different COs, and each one is a moving window. So, what is verification or certification when? It may be that your driver doesn't work in any. So we have to, that's a CNCF thing to figure out. I mean, not for this meeting, but there's something that we need to figure out is, is I think in this, this meeting, we just need to make sure that the CSI drivers that we use work with Kubernetes, right? And that's it. But I, it's a much bigger problem in CNCF. Oh, I was on mute. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm uh, so I, I thought for this do, uh, document, the agenda doc that you guys had write permissions uh, because I added the group Kubernetes SIG storage WGCSI, but it appears you don't. I'm adding all of you explicitly. Uh, is there I was any... able to write to it. What's that? I was able to write to it yesterday. Okay, that's weird because I see Jan yeah. is not able to. Maybe he has a different account. Yeah, I was able to put that logo in there. Mm. Yeah, I can switch my account. To... Uh, I could just add your other account. What's your account? Is it the Red Hat one? Wait, 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 wait. Loading, loading. Come on. It's slow. No, it's no big deal. I just wanted to make sure you guys all have the right permissions. Uh, I sent out an in. No, ignore all of that. Uh, so other than that, the, the, what do we have here? Uh, new unassigned tasks, QCuddle change for volume attachment and CSI volume source, Jan? Oh, yeah. Uh, we just need to change QCuddle to display the volume attachment in a nice way. Uh, it's yep. not difficult, it just needs to be done and not forgotten. Okay, I will, t I will do that. And uh, my Red Hat account has access to the document hey are we is cube cuddle going to be displaying volume attachment or is it going to be displaying the uh the new uh csi what's it called csi volume um, both actually both okay okay so somebody and the point before was uh mm, we yeah, well, it starts. you go to for vacation for a week and the API review will go on. So if somebody wants to fix something there, you have no way how to do that. Yeah, I will uh, give you access to my repo. Uh, I need to look up how to do that, but uh, that shouldn't be a problem. I'll make sure to give, I'll give you access. Uh, anybody else wants it, let me know. <laughs> Use your power for good. <laughs> of course. <laughs> it can't, <laughs> I'm not going to quote Spider-Man. <laughs> okay. Uh, next up, Vlad, you have a cool looking logo there. Oh, yeah. I was 
I was looking at the repo that you created. I was looking at the that default avatar. I'm like, nah, we should have something cool there. So I agree. I'm totally cool with this. I don't know what the trademark implications <laughs> yeah, are. I know. Too many are but. I know. I know. I thought about that too because yesterday in all the documents, there's a registered trademark R that pops up next to all Kubernetes references. So. Yeah, we could uh, start using it and uh, and then if somebody complains, remove it. Yes, it's still an open, yeah. Works for me. <laughs> uh, next up, CSI timeouts uh, by Jan. Uh, so I thought about the etcher design and how it should work and the CSI is blocking, and there is no way how to cancel ongoing calls. So if I call publish, uh, control publish, yep. then I have no clue how long does it take, and Correct. I have no way how to cancel it. Yep. I have seen on Amazon uh, attached to take a couple of days <laughs> and because of misconfiguration. Yeah. But, it just, but it happened. And uh, yep. I remember NFS and iSCSI, they behave very... Mm -hmm, strange in case of timeouts and network failures and they can take minutes and dozens of minutes and yeah. so what are we going to do with that so uh the proposal is uh you have a maximum timeout on your side uh set it to something high enough that it's likely to capture the majority of cases uh maybe 30 minutes or 20 minutes or something uh and uh the if you time out and you have to implement your own retry logic, so you have your own exponential back off for retries, uh, if the uh, attachment volume volume attachment object still exists and you've waited and you want to retry, go ahead and retry uh, and reissue the same call. The volume plugins, according to the spec, must be item potent. Uh, so that if the attachment is incomplete, uh, you just try it again, and then it should uh, continue uh, with the attachment. Now, on the, other, well, on the other hand, the CSI spec says that the CO must issue only one request per volume. Uh, and the previous one was not finished, so I can't issue a new one. Uh, so that uh, that line is a contract between the CO, which is your attacher, and uh, the CSI interface, not necessarily yeah. what's going on in the back end. So uh, as far as you're concerned, uh, the first call timed out, so the gRPC connection terminated, so that operation has terminated. And there is no more pending operation. It, it's true that there might be it, a pending operation on the back end, but is it terminated? Because it's not written anywhere. Uh, if I just close the TCP socket or Unix socket, right? But the the operation is terminated as far as you and the volume plugin are concerned. The volume plugin might have uh, things that are going on under the covers, but you leave that to the volume plugin to clean up itself. Right. Mm, so if the volume plugin then gets another request for the same pending operation, it can just continue on that operation. Uh, it, you, you leave it to the volume plugin to handle. The idea is uh, keep the interface dead simple. Uh, By volume plugin, you mean the Kubernetes volume plugin? Oh, or sorry, the suicide driver. Side driver. Okay. So I will look if there is a way how to terminate mm -hmm. uh, Unix connection. I'm not sure if it is in generated there uh, from the PC. I don't think you want to switch, kill the connection. You, it's, it's the it's the message you want to kill. So you, right. you just use context to do that. You can cancel the context, right? And you should is be able. Possible? To, I don't know. I see. Yeah, I, that, yeah, yeah. Let me check. I'll send you this right here. So. It, that's what uh, the gRPC has a context on every call mm -hmm. and you, you create a context with a timeout or whatever canceling model you want to do and uh, mm -hmm. let me, let me ch I'll put it on the chat here. But it, so that is true what you said Lewis but this is for that timeout is for a request that's taking too long what we're talking about is waiting for um, you know, showing a, a 
like an attach command and waiting for that attach command to actually come back. Yeah, because they're, but that's what I mean. They're, they're blocking calls, right? So mm -hmm. they send the attach command and they block on that RPC call. It's not a. It's not asynchronous. Okay. Against the uh, the volume. Yeah. Provider. Yeah. So um, when they send the gRPC call and you're blocking. You could have a cancel on the context. Yeah. And you say so this took too long. Would we ask the volume to go ahead and and cancel at that point, or do we just lobby that cancel over the wall and then just walk away from it? Because um, you because as, as soon as you cancel, you know it'll attach. You cancel and walk away from it. It's you just like a uh, essentially it should be treated like a network drop. Okay. I get that. Yeah. There's a lot of good stuff in in gRPC that that we can leverage there. Like Lewis if you guys says. have any suggestions, feel free to add it to the doc, and Jan can take a look at that later. All right, I'll put it, I'll put that link in the doc. Yep. It should be clarified in the CSI spec, though. Uh, and what, what what should the clarification be? Sorry. Well, if the connection is uh, if the gRPC times out or is terminated, then the volume driver should revert to the previous state somehow. Right. Uh, so we leave it up to the volume driver to figure out what the correct behavior for it should be. We try not to dictate it too much. The way that we've worded it is that the calls must be idempotent. And so if a call does not complete successfully for any reason, you can then, uh, a subsequent call for the same, with the same exact parameter should result in the same exact result. So that kind of leaves it open to the uh, open to interpretation a little bit to let the volume plugin decide what that means and how to implement it. Okay, so if uh, controller publish them out, mm -hmm. does it mean that the volume is attached or not? It's in uh, an undefined state. It's in an undefined state, and for you, uh, it's up to oh. you how you want to implement your recovery behavior. Well, yeah, I can handle it. That's right. difficult. We do the same in volume plugins now. Yeah. So okay. we have to either we try to uh, uh, you know continue until the attach operation completes, or uh, uh, we can try to detach immediately. Whatever you want. Yeah, 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 I will handle that. Just all the CEOs should handle it in the same way. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. One of the things that I'm seeing out of the CSI spec is that it is more of a what it's more of a uh, contract. Mm -hmm. It's an API spe specification, but it is not a behavior specification yet. Yes, and that was very very purposeful. Yeah. So uh, as we go forward and it matures, probably will turn into a behavior specification. So the CEOs mm -hmm. will behave the same way, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. The, the, the intent with the uh, interface was just that, that it is an interface. It's kind of like uh, uh, defining a network layer. It's like, it's like POSIX. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where you don't specify, you don't detail uh, packaging, you don't detail how things should be done, just what it should be. And that way you leave it uh, open and pluggable. When you dictate packaging too closely, it makes it difficult for folks to actually implement the darn thing. Also, it becomes hard to uh, for future uh, changes. Yeah, because there will be you know packaging and behavioral things that could evolve, but the interface itself can remain stable. Okay. Uh, anything else uh, we want to talk about the timeouts? I'm fine with that. I will study. Okay. Um, so, go ahead. How, how do we plan to handle I mean, as soon as we start coding against that design doc plus the, 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 the CSI spec, mm -hmm. we'll inevitably have to make changes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yep. Do we plan to... to uh, keep the design doc in a live state on living state where we update. Yes. So my goal would be to, uh, for you guys to take a look at that. If you're okay with it, let's merge it. And then you guys can start contributing patches to it. Okay. 
So mm -hmm. do that today, like right after this meeting, if you're okay with it, LGTM it, and I'm going to get okay. that merged. Uh, and then okay. while I'm gone, you guys can feel free to, to, to merge on top of it. Okay. Because some of the like issues we just discussed, like timeout, how, you know, what's yep. the best implementation? Probably won't find out until, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. Could you add the link to the doc that you want us to LGTM on? Uh, yes, it's, uh, yeah, I'll place it into Just the to make it easier. Oh, there it is. Got it. I didn't see it. It's down the S today. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, next up, Chakri, uh, you want to discuss get node ID? Yes. <clears throat> Sorry, this is going to be another controversial topic, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so, how does the daemon setup plug in the node's identity? Because when you're running, right, usually each container gets, or each pod gets its own network identity. It'll come with some weird, fancy name, whatever you give it. And from there, getting a node ID is going to be very tricky, number one. Uh, sorry, uh, getting the node ID, f like... Uh, I thought the node ID was created magically by the CSI driver. No, but the storage subsystem, the controller has to understand, to publish it. Yep. So, so there's a get node ID call and the controller or the s storage plugin has to figure it out. Are you asking about the storage side or the plugins plugin. side or the CO side? Storage plugin side. Okay, so on the storage not, plugin side, you, if it's really complicated, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So you're saying if somebody calls get node ID, uh, how do they figure out what node they're sitting on? Yes, uh, because what has, has its own identity. Unless you do your host network is equal to true, which will be again. I think I, I think it can get a node name via downward API and do something with that. Yes, we need to do that. Actually, I was going through the same thing. The second thing is, if we go that route, 90% of the time, the node ID is actually a property of the node rather than being a property of the storage subsystem, right? So why do you want to make it another node ID and add it as annotation, CSI dot volume node ID and fragment the space so much for driver? Yeah. You know Maybe. what we could do is uh, modify the get node ID uh, CSI call uh, to take in the uh, CO's node ID, mm -hmm. and then uh, the volume plugin can optionally use it to uh, do the conversion, mm -hmm. and it can either return the same string back if it doesn't care, or uh, return its own volume ID that or a node ID which is completely independent. Yes, but again, this goes back to the same question which we are having with the CSI spec, right? This is 0 0.1, yeah. <laughs> and we are making it overly complex. I shall we'll take it in the CSI meeting because somehow I feel that this node ID entirely is kind of like a very very confusing. It's going to be very very fragmented if we give it ability for a plugin to define the node IDs. Uh -huh. So, so yeah. would your recommendation be to eliminate it altogether? I would say eliminate it all together and make sure that the CEO node IDs and these node IDs be in sync because if not, 99.99% of them will be node name. And we are honestly complicating it on 0 0.1 spec. I would love that uh, <laughs> because it would reduce our design complexity uh, yes. considerably. But uh, I'm going to bet that that is going to be very difficult to do. But it, let's, uh, so can you can we, can we just default it? Or make 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 a uh, a point in a design that yeah I mean, default that's what I was thinking is, was is if you well. pass in the uh, st uh, the CO's node ID uh, essentially if the volume plugin doesn't want to implement it right or actually uh, I, I, to you your just put in the capabilities right you say I don't implement it. yeah yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah Chakri why don't you uh, take this to the next CSI meeting and propose it. Okay. Uh, you should make a PR for it too. Yeah. Or create an issue at least. Yeah, an issue. Okay. Uh, and then the issue proposed that either A, eliminate it altogether. Option B, uh, make it a capability like uh, Vlad suggested. Uh, or option C, uh, pass in the uh, CO's node ID so that it can be used and returned. Uh, I would love to see one or two. 
yeah. uh, one is where the conversation goes. Uh, one is good, even two is complicated because then you still haven't removed them. I didn't like the annotation which I saw in the spec on the volume attachment, right? Yeah. That's kind of like, yeah, it's Spark plugin node ideas. That's kind of like, it's going to be very, very fragmented. Okay. I agree. I'll do that. Yeah. What was the, the need for the for the call to exist in the first place? What uh, is it so trying to satisfy? The idea is that there are some subset of storage systems where they don't understand the node IDs that the Kubernetes cluster or whatever cluster uses to identify nodes. It has a completely separate way to uh, reference a node. And uh, the idea would be that when you're issuing a a call against uh, a store, an arbitrary storage provider, you should be able to say, uh, uh, talk its language basically. Like when you tell it to attach to a node, talk its language and say, this is you know what you understand as a node. What I say node A is storage node A. So that would mean that the CEO would need to have a translation between its node name and the- Exactly, and that's what the get node ID call was for. So yeah, actually, I was going to add, I think uh, Scale.io actually is one of those storage platforms that it, uh, it represents the node. I was going to say Portworks probably does the same thing too because it's right. sitting on the node on, on, as a container, but on hostnet and privilege mode. So it could care. It's just, right. Can't so, uh, uh, the storage controller actually establish this mapping inside to the themselves saying that okay I have this this is a node ID this is a corresponding host name if some call comes with the host name can't they do the mapping since you uh, I'm not saying that it can't I'm just trying to say that uh, okay. Okay. I can see the reason why it exists yeah right um, there's a need for it I, I don't know if it should go to one responsibility side or the other I, I'm gonna actually take this offline I'm gonna ask uh, what works people yeah Ooh, sure. I, I, that's I just, one of the reasons what I was gonna add is using the current volume API. Uh, I was thinking about doing um, remote attachment using the attach API, but that's one of the issue I ran into because um, one of the call that re- basically yeah. node info means nothing to me. Mm. So I was going to have to do some clever tricks to figure to extract the name or carry the name around that means something to, to scale IO. Yeah. So I think this, probably is needed um, how it's implemented it's, it's another story yeah um, maybe the capability thing making it optional would be nice but uh, to Chakri's point that doesn't do anything to reduce our complexity yeah. but it sounds like there is a need for it yeah, yeah okay I see the point okay then we'll have it in there <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I think we might end up well uh, I mean Chakri if you, if you do have a either an option or uh, some concerns, definitely, I would say, bring it up. Yeah, I'll just may, you know, maybe it's saying that because this is going to pollute the complete uh, CO layer, right? Because you have a some properties of the sub storage subsystem, and typically, node IDs are actually a property of the node because of the storage subsystem. They have their own established identity, and now, right. when a node means it's different for storage, it's different for networking, it's different for are a CEO and it's different for anything else in the system, right? Then right. These many identities for a single node. And when you want to debug an issue or if you want to do anything in the system, what does it map to? Well, I thought what we're talking about is um, having a component that will annotate the node object, at least for this, the Kubernetes CEO. Yeah. Annotate the node object with what it means to be a node on the storage uh, platform. I agree. Yeah, that that part is clear, but I think what Chakri was arguing was that how does the CEO, uh, how does an arbitrary volume plugin do this if they don't even, you know, if mo- if a volume plugin doesn't care about it, like for example, imagine GCPD running on mm-hmm. G. Uh, right. How does the volume plugin there figure out what node it belongs to if it's probed? It just makes it so for volume plugins that don't care, there's added overhead there. Maybe, uh, maybe we sh- it shouldn't be get node ID, but set node ID. <laughs> uh, set. I would drive that. Or maybe, yeah. That would be the CEO telling it, this is the node ID. And then so that one, one I think is going to face more resistance because these volume plugin vendors really are pushing to not have to maintain state. 
uh, <laughs> so they want to be like, don't don't make me save anything. I, you, you save things for me. Yep. Um, but I think what we could probably argue is that uh, if the node ID from the CO is passed in, that might simplify things because for the majority of cloning plugins that don't care about it, they could just return it. Yeah, but then don't you need to store that somewhere? You have the if CO problem. stores it. I mean, that that we we still need to do the work. Absolutely. Oh, I see what you're saying. It's like saying it's like verifying. Is I check this is okay, and he said yes, and then I'll take care of it. Yeah, or it could say yeah. no, like in the scale I/O case, and say actually, please refer to this node as this. Okay. Actually, yeah, black, and, even in case of scale I/O, right? How does that get the node ID if you are running inside a daemon set? It's probably uh, running in privilege mode. It's it's, well, it's right. Like, so yeah. for so for scale something like a scale I/O. The CSIs, you know, right now, um, it'll be interesting to to see how we, you know, how the, what the deployment will look like. I don't, I'm, I haven't even thought about it because um, part of what we've always done is is not encapsulating portion of the deployment in in any containerized environment at all. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to scale IOB in a CSI uh, port, it'll be interesting to see how the driver itself. Is, is deployed. I, I don't have an answer right now for that. Um, it may be containerized. It may be, you know, just like we've written or SOD has written the, the, the doc, the design doc, not to be too heavy on the prescription side for how the deployment is. So it may be that it's, it's not encapsulated or containerized. So I don't know. I don't, I don't have that answer right now. Okay. Oops. Okay, but so we're a little bit over time. Let's uh, okay. run through the last couple items. It, was there somebody saying something? Okay, so uh, last item here is additional CSI volume source uh, volume attributes such as read only, etc. Yeah, so um, part of what, and maybe you guys. I don't know if you've discussed that already, but the CSI volume source it seems to only carry around uh, read only. Do we need anything else uh, or any way to pass any other attributes back to the? Um, so uh, one of the uh, primary mechanisms to control a bunch of arbitrary attributes is going to be the uh, storage class. Uh, which right. will oh, okay. contain uh, our, an opaque set of parameters. And that's on okay. the provision call. So that's kind of where all the tweaking and customization happens. And the point at which ESI volume source comes in is basically the volume already exists. Uh, okay. And, uh, and we, we kind of just have to point to it and say, please attach it and please mount it. That's it. Okay. Well, I probably want a comment on that because I had the same question when I first time I saw that spec. And, and, yeah, so I, I don't want you to keep writing this answer over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that would make sense. Um, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. One tweak that we it. might have to do, uh, there is an, so uh, I've been pushing hard to remove metadata from uh, volume handle, but it looks like the decision that we ha landed on is, yeah, they're gonna remove metadata from volume handle, but they're gonna pass it in as a new, like or return it as a new create volume info and we're going to have to pass that in on subsequent calls so we might have to extend the csi volume source to uh, hold those parameters uh depending on where that lands but that should be a trivial change for us it would just be an additional field uh string to string map okay All right, uh, so this is going to be my last meeting. I will be back on uh, Monday, November 5. Uh, you guys, uh, I'm sure, are going to be able to handle everything and do great. I'm sure this thing will be done by the time I get back. <laughs> um, oh, you're not in that meeting later on? Oh, I will be in the, yes, I will be in the meeting in an hour, but I think some folks are not going to be able to make it, so. Oh, I see. Okay. And do we have a meeting tomorrow? Or we skip it now?
Uh, there is technically a meeting scheduled tomorrow. It's up to you guys if you want to meet. That's fine with me. Let's see. Add, me. The, add the agenda items. If they, if they have agenda items, we will sync up. If not, yeah. Yeah. Say hi to each other and bye. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I'll um, show up. I'll be there. I gave you guys the ability to modify the event so you can modify it at will. Um, and you have permissions to the doc. <clears throat> I'm going to give you on permissions to my PRs. And uh, I think Brad already has permissions for this Zoom meeting. Um, anything else? All right, then I'll see you guys in a little bit. All right. Bye. See you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.